Well, it will be very tough to uh, talk after Jack. My talk will be less entertaining, I'm sure. Um, but Jack emphasized one very important point. Microbes are key players on your planet. But he forgot to tell you that microbes are not only bacteria. They are super fungi. And I'm sure that super fungi may help to save the world. So my duty today is to demonstrate, to, to tell you that fungi are also very important, key, very key players in, in, in a, a terrestrial ecosystem, at least. So I've summarized my talk there. I'm going to talk about uh, forest ecosystems, the microbiome. I will focus only on fungi on one group of fungi called ectomicrosal fungi, symbiotic mutualistic microbes. Then I will tackle our work on fungal genomics. Using that comparative fungal genomics, we have been able to uh, reconstruct the past of this large group of fungi, the microsal ones. And then, yeah, if, if, if I have a few minutes, I will talk about their symbiosis toolboxes, molecular crosstalk, and at the end, you will decide whether these uh, microbes of fungi are friends or, or furs. As I said a couple of minutes ago, fungi have really shaped the, the planet. Uh, over the last 400 million years ago, they have an affair with the, the plant, and uh, via the colonization of the ter terrestrial environment, environment and ecosystem, they really shape our planet. Everything started about 400 million years ago when tiny uh, uh, plant, lichen, algae, has landed on the, on our, on, on the land and then uh, gave rise to uh, small plants. And these small plants have been able to survive in this very harsh environment thanks to uh, uh, microsal fungi, uh, uh, fungi replacing the roots of that uh, small plants. And then through that association over the million years, uh, it gave rise to uh, trees and uh, big guys as the oak and, and sequoia trees we are knowing now. And so every time I'm walking through a forest, I'm always impressed by these uh, beautiful trees, majestic, majestic organisms, and I'm sure that's the same for you. But most people forget to look at their feet and underground. They don't, they don't realize that microbes are really playing a key role in the functioning of that uh, forest ecosystems. So I would like today to, to demonstrate that we cannot understand the function of uh, forest ecosystems and probably most land ecosystems without getting a better knowledge on the functioning of the microbes. We know very little about how fungal species or functional groups of fungi, the wood decayers, the macrosal fungi, the endophytes, may affect the carbon cycling and storage in, in land ecosystems. If we did, we might be able to make better predictions about how these fungi respond to climate change and in turn affect the rate at which carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. So that's what wrote April a few, few weeks ago, a few months ago. And clearly, uh, understanding the role of fungi on carbon cycling and sequestration is a key question. And I would like to emphasize it's also part of the DOE missions and INRA mission to which I, I belong. So, my job over the last decades has been to harness genomics for understanding tree microbe interactions in forest ecosystems. What are the, the role or the roles of these fungi, these different types of fungi, on carbon cycling, carbon sequestration in forest ecosystems? When I say I, I harness genomics, I, I, I should say uh, I harnessed JGI genomics because JGI has been a key player in, the, in this large-scale program. We are aiming to define, 
to, to describe the fungal communities because we want to dissect the interactions they are setting up with plants. And hopefully, having that information, we may be able to, to use these data sets to generate models, or at least to feed the models, which are currently really missing that information. If you walk through the forest, you will easily uh, spot mushrooms. And in, in most temperate forest ecosystems, but also boreal ones, there are four major groups of fungi. The white rotus, able to decay both lignin and cellulose very efficiently. The brown rotus, they don't mind about lignin. They depolymerize the lignin and go straight to the cellulose to, to, to eat it, to use it. These guys are really able to decompose and decay woods. We have also the leaf decayers in forming the litter and colonizing the litter and using the, de the decaying litter. And uh, I'm mostly interested by that group, the ectomycosal fungi, which are interacting with the plant and using the carbon from the plant. But we know very little about the connections, the interrelationships between these four groups. Are they related, taxonomies? taxonomically speaking, uh, are there how these different lifestyles evolved during the evolution? That's really the main, the main question we have been tackling over the last uh, five, six years. And we have been focusing on one group of fungi, these mutualistic symbionts, the ectomycosal fungi. You know them very well. I know some people that they love chanterelles. Uh, they love matsutake in Japan and Asia. Us in France, in Italy, in Spain, we love truffles. I know some guys there who also love truffles very much. So you see that, and of course, I don't, for, don't forget the king bullets. So all these guys, all these mushrooms, are able to form a symbiotic interactions with trees. In addition to interact with the plants, they're also edible. So all the work we do on genomics of this interaction could be used by the industry to to try to master the production of these mushrooms. Uh, of course, I don't recommend that you eat too much of this uh, fly agarix, except if you, if you want to talk to the gods. So these ectomycosal fungi are mostly basidiomycetes, even if there are a, a few ascomycetes. They are living together with the plants. They are forming mutualistic interactions. Of course, what, what you collect, the mushroom, is just the sexual organ of a, a very dense Eiffel web colonizing the soil there underground under the feet of Lacaria bicolor that Jerry Tuscan introduced yesterday. And these guys are making interactions, symbiotic interactions, and transforming the root system to form a new chimeric organ. So we want to understand what, what, how this new system symbiosis is formed and what, what the role of that system. Of course, the main impact of ectomacrosal fungi can be seen there. These guys are generating a huge Eiffel web, the wood wide web in the soil, where they can really mine, prospect the soil, mine the soil, uptake phosphorus and nitrogen, assimilate that, transfer to the plants, and the plant can benefit from that huge amount of nutrients, and really that mycorrhizal fungi are boosting the, the growth of the plants. And as a reward for that mining work, the plant is providing carbon to the, to, uh, to the Eiffel mycelium and, and the, the web of, of Eiffel. In addition to that, so really mycorrhizae are used by the industry to promote uh, tree seedlings growth. At the same time, they, pay, they play a key role in, in the ecosystems in, in, in the carbon sequestration and carbon cycling. And recently, it has been shown that these networks are also connecting the plant together. This is the mother plant sending nutrients to the, its uh, children plants through that Eiffel web. And so we think that the, the, the plant communities are linked by these Eiffel webs. And so these uh, networks are really forming fungal superhighways. So 
we have been trying uh, to understand the evolution of ectomacrosal fungi and try to identify the symbiosis molecular toolkits by using comparative genomics. We have three main questions. Do all macrosal lineages are arise from similar ancestors and follow similar evolutionary tra trajectories? Are there a common set of genes to interact with host plants? Let's say a kind of ancestral symbiosis toolkit, a group of gene networks involved in the interaction. And are different types of mycorrhizal symbiosis, the ectomycorrhizae, the arbuscular mycorrhizae, the orchid mycorrhizae, the ericoid mycorrhizae, are uh, using similar genomic blueprints. So to do that, to tackle that question in collaboration with the JGI, we have set up the Mycorrhizal Genomic Initiative, which is aiming to sequence a large number of genomes of this somatic fungi and, and, and compare them to understand their evolution. Two guys have been really key players in this program, Igor Gigoriev, leading the JGI fungal programs, and David Ebert from uh, uh, Clark University, who is really a smart phylogenomicist. So we have been sequencing, we are aiming to sequence about 50 of these uh, macros genomes. As of today, we have sequenced more than 38 today. We have a few representatives there. Uh, this, uh, this is a wide range of species covering many clades of the tree of life of Agarum mycotina. And this work has been done in coordination with Dave's Ebert's work. Uh, it's also a CSP program at the JGI, which is focusing mainly on wood decayers and uh, saprotroph. So by coordinating the two groups, the two CSP program, we have been able to compare more than 60 genomes of uh, wood decayers, leaf decayers, and microsal fungi. And we were quite fortunate because by doing so, we are covering first a large part of the tree of life of Basidium mycotina. And we have a wide range of lifestyles. We have in blue, white rots, in brown, brown rotters, in yellow, mostly leaf saprotroph like uh, agar, uh, the, the button mushrooms, in green, the uh, symbionts, and we have a few microparasites. So it's a unique opportunity to reconstruct the past and, and investigate the evolution of these guys. And what did we learn from that? First takeaway point, this is the phylogenomic tree which has been reconstructed by Les Ludnech and Dimitrios Fludas in David's group. They have been using more than 500 genes to uh, run their organismal phylogeny. And so this is really the evolution of agaromycotina over the last 300 million years. You have the different clades, the different species which has been sequenced, the lifestyles. And then first major conclusion, you see there the red squares, this is the emergence of microsal symbiosis. Clearly, the symbiosis, the microsal symbiosis emerged several times over the life of the, over the evolution of this uh, fungi. And it, it, in every clade, in every family of major agarics. So the microsal symbiosis evolved several times from white and brown rod fungi and leaf decayer, as we can see there. For example, Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric, the closest ancestor there is a white rotor. In contrast, Ebaloma cylindrosporum there, the ancestor. Uh, is a white, uh, sorry, uh, Amanita ancestor is a leaf decayer like Agorix and Coprinus. Ebeloma ancestor is a white rotor. And then if you look at, if, if you focus on the bolids and the large clades of the bolitals, the ancestors of, of the bolids are uh, brown rotors. So uh, the uh, ectomacrosal fungi arose several times during the evolution of, of fungi, of mushrooms. <laughs> And they, they really uh, arose from uh, the three main groups of uh, wood uh, and forest uh, decayers. The white rotors probably gave rise to the brown rotors, 
Brown rotus gave rise to ectoma cresal fungi, like the bolids. The white rotus gave rise to the leaf decomposers, which gave rise to amanitas, for example. And, and in certain uh, circumstances, uh, white rotus gave rise to, to macrosal fungi. So it's really new for us. We, we didn't expect that these macrosal fungi evolved so many times from so different uh, saprotrophic uh, fungi. So now, can we, can we understand by screening the gene repertoires, can we explain the lifestyles? Why a uh, fungi could, why fungus could be a, a microsal symbionts or a leaf decayer or a brown rotus or a white rotus? Of course, today I don't talk about endophytes and, and parasites, but they are also very important players in, in, in the game. Can we relate these lifestyles to the gene repertoires? So we have been focusing uh, on, on we, we surveyed the gene repertoires of these fungi, looking at gene acquisition, gene decay, gene duplication, and so on. And we focused mainly on enzymes and genes involved in ca carbon acquisition. Because of course, you, you realize that all these fungi are really uh, uh, growing on their substrate and are using uh, wood or, or organic matter or the plant as a source of carbon. So we have been comparing these uh, genes, and we focus mainly in, co in collaboration with Bernard Henri Sa from, from Marseille, Marseille University. We focus on the K-enzymes, the carbohydrate active enzymes, and the lignin peroxidases, because these two groups of enzymes are really the ones involved in the decay, decomposition, and degradation of lignocellulose. So on that table, we have summarized uh, years of work uh, looking at uh, K-enzymes, mainly uh, on that table, two groups of enzymes, the uh, lignin peroxidase and lignin glyoxylase. And regarding the cellulose uh, cellulases, we have focused, focused on the GH6 cellulases and GH7 hemicellulases and uh, GH61, which is a new family, new family of uh, uh, lipopolysaccharide monooxygenase. You have the different lifestyles, white rots, polypores mostly, uh, soil and litter decayers, brown rotters, and there in green, the ectomarcosal fungi. And you have the number of genes coding for each of these categories of enzymes, with a color code in red means uh, many, in, in, in blue, uh, no, uh, almost no genes in that category. And you see clearly there that the different, the number of enzymes or the number of genes coding for these enzymes is strikingly different in the different lifestyles. As expected, the white fruits are containing the largest number, the largest arsenal of lignocellulose uh, and degrading enzymes with more than uh, uh, 26 for some of the species there. Uh, in contrast, uh, the brown rotors have lost most of the k enzymes and most of the enzymes involved in the degradation of lignin. And similarly, uh, look at the ECM there, the ectomarxal fungi, uh, they really lost everything, uh, except uh, for, for few species having one or two genes. This ectomarxal symbiont, they have lost the, the, the genes involved in the lignin and cellulose degradation. So we can nicely correlate the repertoire, the arsenal of lignocellulose enzymes, degrading enzymes, to the lifestyle. These guys have lost the ability to use uh, lignin and cellulose. They are not saprotroph anymore. So to summarize that, that part of the work, uh, we, can, we can say that on average, Ectomacrosal lineages have reduced, have a reduced complement of genes encoding plant cell wall degrading enzymes, at least compared to their ancestral white rotors and brown rotors. This means that these guys are really able to grow in complex organic matter, and they rely fully on the plants to provide their carbon. But since, uh, less, uh, nevertheless, uh, as ECM lineages have arisen from functionally diverse saprotroph, each of them has retained a unique and restricted array of uh, plant cell wall degrading enzymes. And, and some species like Paxillus are still able to decompose 
part of the lignocellulose, but they are not using that decomposed lignocellulose. They are just making their way through lignocellulose to uptake nitrogen, organic nitrogen, which is remaining in the, in the organic matter. So that was the main conclusion for the, the comparative genomic, uh, genomics work. But of course, when you have genomes, you could run transcriptomics. You can run, or JGI, you could run RNA-seq for you. So we have been using this reference genome of ectomicrosal fungi to run transcriptomic, and Anogad Kohler in, in my group is really key, a key player in that, in that analysis. This is a CSP uh, from the JGI, where she compare the transcriptome of the different associations there. So first, we have, it was a, quite a challenge to be able to to, uh, to generate that symbiosis in vitro for so many uh, interactions, but we did it in collaboration with many people in, in the consortium. And then Anagret run RNA-seq on these different systems, comparing the symbiotic tissues and the free-living mycelium. And she showed that uh, in different associations that you have listed there, uh, during the, the symbiosis formation, there are induction of mycorrhizae induced small secreted proteins that we have called MISSPs, they are effectors. We showed that there are a lot of membrane transporters which are upregulated and taking a, playing a role, a key role in the interactions and the transport of nutrients between the partners. The few remaining chiasmes are used mostly to, to make, the, the, the fungi can use these remaining pectate liases to make their way through the apoplastic space. And we have showed a lot of clade-specific orphan genes. But to make a long story short, I want just to emphasize one result that we obtained yesterday, and it would make the link with what Jerry Tuscan yesterday. Eddie yesterday said that Jerry is a tree. I am the mushroom. I am the fungus in this interaction between uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and INRA. We have been focusing with Oak Ridge National Lab on our, uh, in, within the PMI uh, program. We have been focusing on the small secreted proteins. You see there the IFA of uh, Lacaria bicolor, so that's ectomacrosal fungus, landing on the surface of the root cells. We knew from a while that during that interaction, many small proteins were secreted. A few years ago, we identified glue proteins, hydrophobins, able to link, to anchor the mycelium on the surface of the, of the root cells. But we were very, what can I say, uh, very excited where we, we've seen that some of these small secreted proteins, fungal SSPs, were moving toward the root cells. So among the 300 lacaria small secreted proteins, about 50 of them are induced during mycorrhizae formation. And one of them that we have called mycorrhizae-induced uh, small secreted protein of 7 kilodalton, MISP7, this guy is able to enter the root cells, migrate to the host cell nucleus in 10 minutes, and then in that nucleus, bind to the JAS co-receptor. JAS is a group of protein which, is, which are the co-receptor of the jasmonic acid uh, hormone, the defense hormone in plants. And, and, and usually when, a, when a, a plant is sensing a microbe, bacterial microbe or fungal microbe, jasmonate is increasing tremendously. It's a defense uh, Protein, different hormone. And then jazz, jasmonate acid, jasmonate bind to CO1, CO1 bind to jazz, and lead jazz to the degradation. So as soon as jasmonate accumulates, jazz, which are repressor, are de decayed, and then this is leading to the elicitation of defense reaction. So when lacaria is progressing within the root cell, and you see there it's a massive amount of mycelium penetrating. Everything green there is a mycelium. The, the poplar roots are sensing the fungal mycelium, eliciting the accumulation of jasmonate acid, jasmonate, and then 
jazz should be destroyed, destructed to elicit the defense reaction. But thanks to MIS-7, MIS-7 binds to jazz and prevents the interaction between jazz monates and the jazz receptor and stabilize the jazz receptor, avoiding the elicitation of defense reaction. So Lacaria has learned to control the plant immunity. So it's probably a key step in the evolution of these fungi. So of course, there are 50 effectors, and we expect that Lacaria is using these effectors not only to control the jasmonate receptor, but probably the cytokinin receptor, the auxin receptor, and a few metabolic pathways. So when I started to work on mycorrhizae in many years ago, when I gave talk, I saw mycorrhizae, it's a love story. It's a marriage. It's a nice way of living. It's an harmony. But think about you. If your lover would inject you a molecules to control you, would you think it's love? So I'm tending now to think that uh, mycorrhizae is not a love story. It's probably a nan first surrender or a very old couple. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, to summarize what I told you today, uh, Comparative genomics has been tremendously important to, the, to, to propose an evolutionary scenario for the evolution of these fungi. First, we have observed a convergent evolution of the mycorrhizal habit lifestyle in fungi. It occurred via the repeated evolution of a symbiosis toolkit. First, reduced number of uh, degrading enzymes so they have to lose their teeth. And then innovation and creation of a large set of lineage-specific suits of microsome induced effectors, including MISP7-like guys. And so they have learned to talk to the plants and control the plant immunity. If you want to read more on that story, I recommend you to read that paper that we have released in Nature Genetics a couple of weeks ago. Of course, everything I told you today is, is really a, a summary, and I have talked on the behalf of the Microsoft Genomics Initiative Consortium. It's a large consortium of more than 10 groups and 50 people who have been working hard to understand the evolution of that uh, very fascinating uh, group of uh, fungi. And if I ask the question, super fungi, mushroom, can mushroom help save the world? You say? Yes. And uh, I should say uh, the last words, thanks to the 1,000 fungal genomes and the different CSP programs, thank, frankly speaking, JGI is transforming mycology. For us, it's a different world now that we have all these genomes. Thank you, JGI, and thank you to you for, for your attention. All right, thanks so much for a great talk. I think we have time for a couple questions. All right, well, I'll kick off with one while people think about, formulate their questions. Um, you showed this kind of repeated evolution of the mycorrhizal symbiosis. How does that tie in with host specificity? Did each of those events have a different host specificity, or is there also a lot of host specificity? No, mo most of these fungi branches? are very uh, Flexible and, and it's very rare to have all specificity in ectomyxal fungi. They can interact with many species, many trees. Okay. Yeah. There's no really co evolution. Right, so, um, in, in the human gut, right, we have a situation whereby um, enterococcus strains of bacteria can prevent fun, fungal invaders like, uh, well, you know, fun, fun, some fungal uh, groups from, um, from, like Candida, from uh, germinating, right, and, and producing hyphae. Um, you've got a situation where a, a fungus is invading a plant, overriding its immune system yep. um, to form a symbiotic relationship, but there's got to be bacteria involved in that relationship. That sure. can't be acting in isolation. Sure. So some of the metabolic relationships you're examining must have 
I'm not, I'm not trying to drag bacteria kicking and screaming back into your story, but it would be really <laughs> exciting to look at the metabolic uh, yeah, compounds being yeah, released. Yeah, bacteria there. are also important for Yay. that. <laughs> <laughs> for that symbiosis. Sure. We have what we call mycorrhizae helper bacteria. So uh, they are really promoting, we don't know yet how, but they are promoting the interaction between the rootlets and, and, and different types of ectomycrosal fungi or arbuscular fungi, in fact. Uh, so we don't know how yet, but it's really, they are also key players. Do the bacteria have to be co-associated with the root? I mean, like on the root to actually be doing that? I mean, do they have to be part of the plant system? We think that they are living in the cell wall of the, on the IFA and they are shuttling, some of them are shuttling between the inside of the IFA and the outside. All right, well, thanks, Francis, again. Um, yeah. <laughs>